This podcast is sponsored by Odds Monkey. Beat the bookie and make money whether you win, lose, or draw. Swing by oddsmonkey.com today to try the UK's number one matched betting service for just one pound. Enter promo code BIRDCAMP when you register and upgrade to premium. Hello and welcome to the Guna Ramble podcast. I'm your regular host, Giles, and joining me this evening is Mark. How are you doing, mate? You right? Yeah, I'm all right, mate. A little bit bored because obviously no Arsenal this weekend, so. Could be all for the better, to be honest with you, the way things have gone recently. Yeah. You know. Uh, anyway, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our special guest, former Arsenal player, uh, it's David Hillier. How are you doing, Dave? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Giles. All right, Mark. Uh, yeah. Nice to be on, on the show today. No, I appreciate what did you have for Sunday on, dinner? Mate? I know you, you you wanted to knock off after your Sunday dinner, but what, what did you have? What did you gobble down this evening or today? Roast chicken, mate. Roast chicken, roast buds. Nice bit of veg, a couple of Yorkshire puts. Nice. Understandable. Understand. Standard, standard. Standard, standard, standard fair. All right, so um, let's kick on. Um, we wanted to invite you on, basically, to give us, um, you know, your your uh, stories from years gone by and under the Arsenal uh Kenya, and um, so yeah, let's kick it off by asking, um, how did you get involved with the Arsenal, Dave? Well, I suppose you know, there's always been sort of um, scouting regimes. All, all clubs have had their scouts everywhere, and just just got watched when I was playing school and, and Sunday football. Really, about around about twelve, started off um, kicking a ball from the local clubs, Millwall and Charlton. Um, and then kind of decision time at 14, really, what what club I chose out of Arsenal, um, Cheltenham and, uh, and Millwall. Who, who scouted you for Arsenal? Um, well, there's a, a fellow called Fred Ricketts. He, he was he was my scout. He was the, he'd done the, sort of the South East, Bexley Heath and um, all, all the way down to Peckham. I mean, he, he was involved with uh, Kev Campbell as well um, a little bit. So, yeah, it was... Um, L- lovely old fella, um, pro- proper old school football fella. Um, you know, bought me a jacket to go and have me um, to sign my schoolboy forms in because obviously my mum and dad were skinned. We was like quite a poor family, um, and looked after me from day one, um, like like the club did. You know, they looked after their their, their own, and uh, I think um, it was inevitable that I signed for them. Really, Arsenal. I mean, South East London and South London in general is a very sort of furtive uh, hunting ground for for the Arsenal boys. Yes. Um, looking back over the years, Mike, Mickey Thomas and. David Rocky Rowcastle to name two, but as you said, Campbell, Kevin Campbell come from Southland. Were you aware yeah. of him growing up? You know, I played going... against I played mm-hmm. against Kev every, every season Sunday football. Um, he, he played for I think his school was called Four Fields, um, and um, we played against them in in what was called the Black Cup back then. It was a London Cup of um, sort of like South v. Um, Deeper south, if you like, closer to, more to the centre, because we were sort of south east London, right out by in the Greenwich Borough. Um, but yeah, came up against him uh, in Sunday football. He was a centre forward, and I was a central centre back at the time. Mm-hmm. Up until I was sort of twelve, thirteen, I played against him, and he was six foot when he was eleven, and he was he was a powerful beast back then. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we, we we grew up together. Went round his house for dinner with his mum and dad. You know, all the old school food and that. Yeah, it was it was good. How, d- how different do you think it must be nowadays, then, David? With, with the fact that you know you said that 14, you had to make a decision. I mean, nowadays they got to make a decision a lot younger than that. I mean, mm. do, you f- do you think that's 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 better, or do you think it's uh, just it's become a bit more t- t- too much pressure on very very young kids and their parents nowadays? Uh, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely that. There's a lot of false hope. You know, there's a bigger net thrown out now and they, and they grab sort of 400 kids and still only 10 get through at the end um so there ain't no these academies and that, i don't think they've produced any more top end footballers but i think what they have done they've they've lifted the level of football throughout football and amateur football it's never been so high you know i, I live in bristol and there's, there's more amateur clubs anywhere in, in the southwest than anywhere in the country um and the level is 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 good um, because a lot of these these players up until 16 have been trained at, at pro clubs, but unfortunately, you know, it still comes down to the natural talent and the ones that that, that are always meant to make it. Um, a lot of kids 
even back in the days sort of like slipped through the net and you know eventually yeah. made their way back as you, I mean Ian Wright Jeff Thomas to name two um or was it sorry not Jeff Thomas um Pardew Pardew to name two I mean how as Mark was saying how how is it it must be a lot harder I mean it's still I mean we see we look at um Jamie, uh, Jamie Vardy who's come come up through the non-league yeah. ranks and whatnot I mean how how I mean, is it, do you find it? Do you think it's harder nowadays for them to sort of like? Yeah, instant instant yeah. results now, isn't it? You know, mm. people can afford to buy results and and buy buy that level of player rather than take a chance or take a gamble. But you'll always get those those managers that um that that, that know the the lower leagues and the, the one or two players that they think could really make the transition. So I think you'll you'll continue getting one or two. Um, and a plus that I think the English game breeds a certain kind of player. You can buy anyone from Europe and that, but but if the right English player comes along at the right time, it don't matter whether he's playing on league like Jamie Vardy, you know, because he will do it at the top end. Unfortunately, you know, he's not, not followed <laughs> it up this season because he's yeah. been busy doing a film and stuff, I suppose. But um, <laughs> you know, it, it, oh, I don't know. It's all it's all relative. But I, I still feel the old way was good for me. It was good at the mm. time. Um, and, you know, like I said, I had to make that decision at 14. And it, it was it was because, actually, I mean, I don't want to talk about it too much, but Eddie Heath, who was the the, the guy in the news at Chelsea, the coach, yeah. um, he was actually my coach at Cholton when I was 13. And I would have signed for Cholton had he not died seven days before I was due to sign for them. Wow. Um, and he died. He died. And I just thought, you know, I've got no one I really like at Cholton anymore. I'll go and sign for Arsenal. Right, that, that, that was kind of it. It's interesting because we, we just signed a kid called Cohen Bramall, isn't it, from from Hensford Town, and um, yeah, he looks like one. From what I hear, is he, he could make it. Um, Mark, you want to come in? Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna uh, push it on a little bit, David. I was just gonna ask you about the '87-'88 uh, FA Youth Cup uh, run uh, that obviously culminated in the two-leg final against Doncaster. Yeah, uh, that you uh, you captained that side, didn't you? I, yeah, I kind of nicked it off Pat Scull at the end. There was, um, a, I think, an altercation over a night out. All the lads had a bit of a night out, and Pat, who was our club captain or, or our team captain, um, he, he was a bit worse for wearing. Pat Rice didn't take too kindly to it, and <laughs> thought he'd punish him by taking the captaincy away. So I'll, I'll always say that Pat was our captain, but we had a great side. You know, we had we had the side that the equivalent in the league at that time would have won the league. Because we was so tight, so connected, yeah. knew what we was doing week in, week out, battered teams, yeah. you know, battered them properly. And um, yeah, we had a real good thing going. It was a great team to be involved in. Um, some of the lads, you know, didn't go on to have, have great careers, but like I you said, they, players like them slip through the net. You yeah. can get to apprentice and still slip through the net. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, if, you, if I quickly run through that team, you had Alan Miller in goal, Lee Francis, Jim Carstairs, yourself. Oh, yeah, Lee. Al Jimmy Hannigan, Fun. Steve Morrow, Al Neil Heaney, Francis Kajijiao, who I think he does some scouting stuff maybe for the club now. Yeah, right? I think he's in a national scout or yeah, something. Cause yeah, he is, yeah. yeah Super Kev up, up top, Steve Ball, Gary McKeown, and the, the two subs, it looks like, were Ray Lee and Pat Scully. Now, I mean, among them lads, you know, obviously there's some names there that everyone's going to be familiar with from Arsenal. Um, any of them that you sort of thought, should have made it but but didn't is there one where you sort of thought I don't understand how this guy never made made the, the, the top grade well I mean Steve Ball was a fantastic footballer I mean he was like he was like a Glen Oddle but we didn't need a Glen Oddle Arsenal you know we needed someone who who a bit of a touch and tackle and then maybe played a pass yeah uh, we was a tough team and and I think that that was what the 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 management at the time the, like George Graham Theo Foley, um, Pat Rice, um, later on with Stuart, um, you know, t- uh, Tommy and uh, st- uh, Tom, uh, Terry Burton and Tom Coleman, yeah. you know, they, they they was all singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah. And we, we, the youth team trained the same as the reserves and the same as the first team. So you, you was interchangeable. So um, th- there, was, there was a real good connection at the club at that time. Um, and I just think it bred... It bred that and it culminated in us, you know, unfortunately not all of us going into the first team, but because a wave had gone through before us with the likes of Nicky Thomas, um, Merce, Tony, Rocky, do you know what I mean? It, it, it was, it was a, like a little conveyor belt and we knew we was on it and you knew that if you got into the reserves, you got a chance of getting in the first team. 
yeah. and, and win things, and that that was what was good at the club at the time. Yeah, it certainly was. So, um, where you obviously you won the U Cup final then about what eighty eight or nine eighty nine you signed professional form is that right? Yeah, well, we sort of um, you, you, it was a standard one year first. No one got more than a year. Mm-hmm. They they just signed you a year at eighteen, and then at the end of that they made a decision. So sort of 80% of us got through that first year so you, even if you signed a year's contract you weren't guaranteed nothing you knew that was a year for you to turn into a decent reserve team footballer and show that you could you could do it with um, a, a, a higher level a stronger level uh, and yeah I did that and then signed a couple of years at, at 19 um, a two year contract at 19 till I was 21 and managed to get in the team just just um, into the into the start of that season uh, when I when I was 20 um, so, so I was I was quite fortunate that at that time, because the squads weren't massive, two injuries and you're in the first team, and that's 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 what happened. Do you remember anything about your debut? I think it was a League Cup game against Chester, Chester. City. Yeah, Chester City. Um, I think we won one nil. Merce scored, and I had to. I just remember being under pressure all day because I knew I was going to have to stand up in the dressing room and do a speech. That was whatever the the, the the newest player in the team did, and and it was um, taken for granted that you. You, you slag off the manager a bit, you know. I take a joke on his. Unfortunately, that day George Graham had worn the worst tank top that you've ever seen in your life, like. And so I just hammered him for his attire, and um, got a few laughs and, and got over it. And, and the lads, the lads got me through the game. But um, yeah, couldn't believe it. Went on to play, I think, twenty two ty- twenty two games, maybe ten, nine or ten as sub. But had a, had a, a fantastic season, yeah. Mark. Um. What was it? What was it like under George? Because you know, I mean, we've all got we've all got a view of of what George was like as a as a sort of taskmaster, particularly in working the old back four and on the offside trap and uh, and and in being quite a disciplinarian. But, but you know, what was what was the truth like? I think it's he, he's, he's the, for for starters, he's the only bloke now that I still call gaffer out of anyone that's managed me in any work that I've been involved in. I would find it hard to call him George because yeah. he, he deserves that level of respect from me. Yeah. Um, kind of like the headmaster walking into the classroom, you know, when you're all flicking bits of paper at the teacher yeah. and then he walks in and everyone goes quiet. <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of the, the, the influence he had on the team. But also he appreciated what players were and because he'd been one. So he knew he'd like a beer. He'd let you get away with a little bit. He'd even shout you a drink at the bar. He'd come over and take the mickey out of a girl you was with. Um, you know, maybe he'd, he'd come over and ask her if she was blind or something like that. Um, you know, while you was with her. So he had all the banter. He knew how to yeah. go between the levels, but he always maintained that gap between yeah. the first team. And he let his coach fill that gap in. Um, Theo did it great. Stuart did it great. Um, but uh, And he was a disciplinarian. You knew if you did something wrong, you got caught, you get in trouble. But you knew... That you would um, deserve to be in trouble. Was there a kind of a? Sorry, go on, Dave. No, no, I was just going to say he was. He was just honest, and you know, you knew that it was kind of like you know, if you'd been caught out, and you knew when you walked in the house, your dad was going to slap you. Mm-hmm. That, that was it. You knew it was coming. Was there a kind of a good cop, bad cop thing going on between George and Theo, or George and is it, um, Stuart. Stuart, or any of those? No, I don't. I, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think they, they. I think they both had as much respect for George as the players did. So you, you know they would um, they would have the same levels of of respect around him that we did, um, and he just he, he just carried that about him, um, and, and he, he he got the best out of everyone. He was I think looking back, you know, and what I know about coaching and management now, it was a very simple kind of management, basic, but that suited what he had there, and he just added the little touches of finesse, and he and he and he got what he what he deserved. Yeah. Um, just wanted to like move forward a little bit now, uh, Dave, and take you through to the 1990-91 season. But just just before I do, were you at Anfield in '89? <laughs> I wasn't. No. Um, you know, cause I wonder because I had a look. I, I was looking today at the pictures, and I could see like Alan Miller's there in his suit, and there's a couple of the other lads. But I couldn't see you, so I did wonder whether you'd actually got 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 on that trip. No, I wasn't even in. I wasn't even training with the first team. Uh, at that uh-huh. point, of the, you know, we had we had quite um, not clear divides, but we had youth team, 
reserves first team and maybe two from the reserves would move up into the first team for the squad for the weekend yeah um you know depending on injuries whatever so so the, the squads didn't fluctuate too much yeah. i think kevin i think kevin and alan alan miller were the only two i'm not sure if stephen morrow squeezed in and i went think he up. did he I, might, think, I think he did he I've might seen have squeezed in yeah, it was like a 17th man or 18th yeah. man. But <laughs> that it wasn't until after that um, that, that yeah, I got my chance for, yeah. for a couple of injuries. Cool. So then moving forward to the 1990-1991 season, obviously this is a huge season in Arsenal's history. Um, and I just wanted to uh, to have a chat with you about it. And one, one, one incident uh, in that season, of course, uh, we all remember is the, the Battle of Old Trafford. Uh, were you up there for that? I was I was at Old Trafford. You yeah. were at I Old was, Trafford. I was oh, in the squad. Yeah. I was I was on the bench. Yeah. Did you get on the pitch? Um, no, I wasn't. I wasn't in the in the squad on the bench. I was seventeenth man. Yeah, but you I didn't. You, some, you still didn't get yeah. on the pitch for the tear up though. Yeah, legally or illegally. No, <laughs> believe you, believe you me. I was I was standing next to Anders Limpar about to lamp Dennis Irwin. Good man. And uh, yeah, I was in the. F- I was the. F- I was the first or second off the bench. It was right. In- it was just to the left of us, just down. At- I think Anders had skilled Irwin again. He twisted him up again, and and then there was an- then uh, Mickey flew in with Ince, and it all. Ah, oh, yeah, it was all. It was all going off. Yeah, we just. Yeah, it was. It was almost like a proper fight. Everybody else was sort of went into the background and there was like eight yeah. people involved and yeah it was um it was a big deal yeah for the now, boys the, the interesting clip that i think a lot of people have seen on that is that after we got fined the two points i think george graham uh it got filmed speaking with all you mm. lot like sitting around at the training ground listening to him and he was saying how disappointed he was that you know we'd let arsenal down and the behavior and it wasn't acceptable and all that I've always wondered when when the cameras went off and they all buggered off. <laughs> did he did he yeah. say? Do you know what lads? Fucking good yeah, job, that's a load of rubbish. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course <laughs> he did because he'd been protected us properly. But and as I said before, he was a player, and and one word that if if he said one word every day in training, guaranteed, and every day every game and every half time and before every game in every team talk, it was the word camaraderie. And he because of the Scottish little bit of twang as well. You know, I'm not going to make a fool of myself and try and say it like he did, but it, it was his word, and yeah. he would. He was more than happy for us to to go in as a group and stand by each other. And when he heard, you know, I, I was out in Covent Garden one night with a with a lad picked a you know, picked on the wrong person at the bar. He was rather large, and within two seconds, Tony Adams and Boldy were there, like saying to the fella, "Look, if you start on him, you're starting on us." And it got back to the gaffer, and he was like, "Listen." That's what happens here. I'm not happy with you being out drinking. I'm not happy with you doing this, but I'm happy that them boys stood by you. I mean, I've got a bit of a rollicking for it, but yeah. he, he understood it was yeah. we were the team yeah. and we we fought together. Yeah, and you could see you you could see that, couldn't you? That was half of the reason why we got through a lot of them games was, which you know we'll come to a little bit later. But it was such team spirit. Yeah, in that you side. accept you accept criticism from people and take it for what it is as well, because you know you'd all give each other bollockings. I was just as able to have a go at Tony Adams or Boldy if I felt, and they would they would respect it, and same as I'd take it from them. And that is a team, you know, when you can't, you, you can't. get each other. Going all the time. Can't really imagine there's a great deal of that going on in our squad at the moment. To be fair, I don't see. I don't see. No, I, and I, that that's that's what disappoints me um, because I think it's become a really nice place for players to come and 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 have nice careers and uh, nice money and yeah. everything's nice and yeah. it's. I don't. I don't know where nice ever came into football for me. <laughs> nah, that's fair enough, mate. That's fair enough. So let's take it. Let's let's talk about the uh, the one game, the one block on the uh, on the cop on the on the copy book. Uh, yeah, that was my fault. Take us through that. Chelsea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was tough, wasn't it? We didn't have Tony. What? What, what, what was he injured? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just injured. Just just taking a little holiday. I, 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 I think, think he was yeah. doing he was doing about eight hundred press ups a day. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so so we didn't have Tony, and um, I think Boldy and, and Andy started the game, and Boldy got a, Boldy got a knock, and I had to go on centre half, and he had, you know I could sweep a bit around two big players, but I weren't. Yeah, I played up against Kerry Dixon, and Graham Stewart was a bit mobile as well, um, and uh, to, to be honest, I think we got a bit of a run around that game, 
um, it, it weren't the best. And you know, I held my hands up, and it, and it was it would have been the, the ultimate season if if that result. It would have been, wouldn't been it? Been slightly different. Yeah. I think I think Dicko's got to hold his hands up as well for one of the goals, isn't he? One, yeah, one of... I think uh, we, we. Yeah, well, I mean, goals. You, you can go back. George always used to, used to say there's three mistakes that lead to a goal. You know, and I can pick on anyone really in the yeah. team, then can't you? You can yeah, you yeah. can say, oh, he lost the ball, and then it happened, and then that happened. Yeah. So it, it, it depends how far you want to take it back. Yeah. You know, yeah. mistakes are mistakes. Yeah, yeah. You, I just I just you didn't want you. You don't to Yeah, but I, I yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, it was Dicko's fault then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I didn't want tomorrow's headline to be the man who who cost Arsenal yeah. two invincibles. But um, with, <laughs> with with that, when you like, so just jumping forward we'll come back again but jumping forward to the end of the season when you sort of won the title and you got a trophy in that did any of you ever sort of think or did George ever say anything about the fact that you'd only lost that one game and you'd only lost it by the one goal and it was sort of unfortunate no. circumstances or did no. no one really sort of even think about it it was just we won the title that's all that matters do you know what we didn't no one I don't even remember um, focuses on in it after when people um, had made us aware of it. Yeah. Um, you, you know, it, it, it wouldn't. It was no way highlighted like it would be today. Okay. I mean, if you mm. if you, you've only got to go three games without a goal uh, conceded now, and everybody's saying, "Oh, they're on a great run," blah blah blah. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's just it just makes me laugh. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I don't think we really noticed. I think because of our organisation and our discipline, it was geared towards not conceding goals. We didn't expect to concede goals, so we wasn't surprised when we didn't. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. So when we got when we went ten games without conceding or whatever it was in each chunk or, or however, we we didn't focus on that, and then it became oh we've only lost one this season. It became that. Yeah. It wasn't a, it wasn't a focus. Yeah. Um, it was. It was just part of our development. How we how we was disciplined. Yeah, it's an incredible incredible uh, achievement to be fair to win the league and only yeah. lose one game I mean you know we've all seen how much uh, the, the 2004 team has been lauded through being the Invincibles but you know they had a couple of sticky sticky patches and, uh, and, and sticky yeah. games so it, it and does. there was £200 million pounds worth of players on the pitch yeah. do you know what I mean so yeah. you know players that were worth were, were all worth what Ian Wright was worth Yeah. We, we didn't have a team of them when we did that we had yeah. maybe four or five players that were like that and and a squad of eight or nine others that supported it that wasn't in those that bracket of being a a you know a top a top four top three player yeah. you know we didn't have that yeah. um, so, so so yeah it was it was a massive achievement but I think that was down to, down to management and structure at the club because we, as I said we've been doing that since I was fourteen yeah um, and that was that was seven and a half years later so for seven and a half years me as a kid had been being trained the same way so all these men that were in front of me were being trained the same way yeah. and it, it ended up in three four really really prosperous years for George and the team yeah they were indeed mate um later on in in that 1991 season I, I remember being down at the Dell horrible ground that was when uh Jimmy Case injured you um, yeah obviously I'm not suggesting it was uh, on purpose but he, he, there was a challenge between you and Jimmy Case and I think you got injured and that meant you missed the semi against Tottenham yeah um, gutted, gutted. And, and now and I've always I've always always been one of my bugbears that you know I know that Gaz had, had a stormer especially that first half uh, in that semi but I still always say that if we'd have had you in that team that day it might have made a bit of a difference because you were more of a, a shielding midfielder uh, then I think uh, I think it was Mickey that came into the team. So yeah. I, I, I I always like to think that maybe if you hadn't got injured and you'd have played in that semi, we we might have got through. I mean, what what was what was the mood in the camp like on that day? Ah, uh, do you know what? I, I was straight on hospitality in the morning, so I was I, was, <laughs> I, I don't remember the mood in the camp. I, I know that I was quite merry by kick off. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 do you know what? I've never sung my own praises, and I'm not. I don't. I don't claim to be a bird camp you know I was a square peg for a square hole when I was a, a I've said to you you know a couple of injuries and I got in I was, I was quite fortunate but I did I did well with what I had um but one thing I've always said and I've been asked this question a lot it came up a few weeks ago when Gaza was doing an, an after dinner thing down in Bristol and I went along um and I did a little chat there and and it's the only game that I'd, I'd definitely I'd, I'd have killed Gaza he would not have done, he would not have played that game 
Yeah. I'd have I'd have been all over him. And and you say I was a I was um what did you say? Someone shielding, who, shielding, a shielder. Yeah. yeah. Shielding. I don't know if I was a shielder. I think I could I could target people, and I was disciplined at, at doing targeting my areas to work in. Yeah. And I knew I knew what I had to do in those areas, and and I guarantee he wouldn't. He wouldn't have got a look in that day. And I told him at, at the dinner, but he, he was so off his head, he didn't notice. Um, <laughs> he didn't even know who I was, to be fair to him. But, uh, but he was still funny. I've got to say that. He was funny. Yeah. And he's, he was, yeah, yeah. It's a good night out. If ever you get to go a night out yeah, with yeah. Gaza or he, one of his, yeah, please do it. I don't promote much Tottenham stuff, but yeah, it's, it's one of the, it, it's, it's definitely one to go to. But, um, yeah, I think it, it would have changed. Jimmy, Jimmy Case done me just before at half time, actually, against yeah. Southampton. I went in and had four stitches in my shin um, before half time, and I think when he saw me come out a second half, he thought that's a bit odd. I thought I'd finished him, yeah, so he yeah. did that the next tackle and tore my knee ligaments. Hacking, um, yeah. Na- yeah. nasty bastard. I got him back though. We played yeah. when I was at Portsmouth. We played. Um, uh, sorry, when I was at Bristol Rovers, we played Brighton in the reserves, and he was at Brighton. Yeah. And I got one of the young lads to do him, and uh, he elbowed him in his ear, and I didn't realise he had a he had his ear in aid in, and my the kid he elbowed his ear in aid into his ear, and he had to get ambulanced off. Bloody hell! Um, so yeah, it was uh, yeah, you know what goes goes around comes around. <laughs> exactly served him right to be fair. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to I want to ask about that season because um, for the guy, for guys a lot of the fans that remember that season, uh, looking back, we think. That was a bloody good team. It was a bloody exciting team. I know George set us up to not concede. Yeah, and we, it scored, was. we considered a lot. Of, we scored. We considered very few goals. But looking down the results, I mean, there was lots of four nils, five ones, three nils. You know, yeah. we were taking teams apart. Liverpool, I remember at home. I think we'd done them three or four nil around December. I think just before the Chelsea game three and whatnot. Nil, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, and, and it's not really it, that fact is not really highlighted when people look back on that ninety-one team. I mean, what was it like playing with, with, with the likes of Rocky and, and Limpar and, and Smithy up front in his pomp and Merce and all those well, guys? I mean, do, do you know what? I don't, I don't go on many of these things and I don't ever discredit players I played with or, or, or other players in my team. Um, and like I said to you, I'm pretty honest about my levels and, and what sort of player I was. But I think right at that time, that team, like you said, was a real cracking balance, right? I think... Um, when when we brought John Jensen in, lovely lad as he was, and Stevie Morrow started playing in the midfield, and maybe Ian Selly with me, I think we kind of lost a bit of creativity with the likes of Limpar, and it couldn't support four of us similar sort of players. But when I was in that team, just with the other players around me, with like Rocky around me, with Anders on one side, you know, Merce and you know Smudger, all these players, and a nice kind of look at it now and think. I think that about Cockerlan because I don't think Cockerlan's a worldly player. You know, I just think the other players around him, when he's got Cazorla next to him or a real player, it, he blossoms. Just, you know, yeah. it makes him look so much better because it mm. highlights his importance in the team. But and and I felt like that amongst those players, we had some. Even when he brought Glenn Helder in, Glenn had some great flair down the left hand side. Loved playing with that that European style. Um, but but that particular team, we was yeah we was just just right if we could have stayed you know without injuries and then Rocky obviously left and you know bits and pieces and, and players came in and out but that was yeah when, when you look back we scored some good goals there were some really good creative goals as well some great passes from Anders you know from himself crosses and moves goals from Ian Wright it was yeah it was a, it was a fantastic season but it was built on the defence people think yeah you know, so yeah, yeah, you're right. You, you look at it, you look back and think, no, nah, do you know what? Offensively, they were pretty tidy. And the thing is, you're all around a good age. You know, that yeah. team should have gone on and dominated for a good few years to come. We, we probably know. could have. We probably, we probably could have. You know, but I think football was moving in a different direction, and sort of even the addition of, of when George left and 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 Dennis came and um, Dave Platt. You know, we we kind of started moving towards more the European side, and then. Then obviously Arsene came and, and things things did change and I think that was a I think it it was a player mentality thing. The English players wasn't as advanced in looking after themselves as the European players were, so a few a few more of them came over and then we adopted that style, the Wenger style if you like, and then and, and the rest is history. Well that that, that was uh, that was a superb team, uh, Dave, I have to say. I love that side. Um just want to uh, take you forward. I mean, obviously, we've got past 
one banana skin in Sutton and uh, I'm yeah. fairly, fairly confident that we'll get past another banana skin in Lincoln but uh, as, a, as a player who was on the pitch that day could you uh, tell us a little bit about the Wrexham game? Mm. <laughs> well yeah um, I, I don't really know what happened you know it was a I mean all pitches were rubbish back then but it was a muddy nasty horrible wet windy you know not making well, excuses it's the same for them just just the uh, actual atmosphere was always it was tight um, at Wrexham the, the actual stadium and I just think that it, it just wasn't a game we ever dominated um, did, was, it, was, it an o, was it an OG we scored as well? Uh, it, I don't know I know one, one Mickey Thomas back. yeah Mickey Thomas got the one of them didn't he I don't know what the other one was but didn't we have yeah, a, was, didn't we have a goal ruled out near the end Jimmy, Jimmy was it Jimmy Carter or someone or Oh, do, do you know what? It was just it was just a bad day, and then yeah. and then I, I don't think uh, you know we, we went to Yeovil, didn't we, and and beat them in in the cup, and and right he scored. Yeah, I think did he get an hat trick? Yeah. And um, I don't think we played any better against them. Yeah. You know, yeah, we got an hat trick, and then you go to yeah, it's just just one of those things that as a young player it, you just go somewhere. It's just a, a, a grubby game. A bit like the, I watched the Sutton game on telly. I thought that was a bit of a grubby game. It didn't really look like league football to me. No. Um, even though even though we knew it was a Premier League side on the pitch, yeah. and I think you know you just get down to that level and the atmosphere is it, it just affects you and you know and for then Mickey Thomas to score that fantastic free kick that he still winds people up about now. We see him on the on the X Pro playing circuit and that and um, he's he's still living it up on that. He's still dining out on that goal. I bet he is. To be I, fair, I remember. Yeah. I'm, I remember George Graham in the press saying it was his lowest moment in football. I mean, how bad was the atmosphere, you know, after the game in the dressing room, you know, going home on whichever mode of transport you took? I did you know what? It was, it was so long ago I, I, and, and so many games have gone past that day. I think as a footballer, you just learn to, to get on with it. Yes, I think, I think it's right for every manage, manager to come out and say it's his lowest point, but... You know what? I think realistically, most managers, you know, to, to when the game's finished, it's 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 tomorrow's fish and chips paper, mate. Yeah. You know, it's it's yeah. they're they're focusing on the next game. The next game. And although although they say this to the press and that, and I'd never want to discredit what they say, but although they say this, that, and the press to the press and their reactions, you know, yes, they're they're as peed off as anyone can be, as any fan or or, or player or. or member of a club or supporter would be but you just you just dust yourself down and move on you know mm-hmm. and it was just just one of those things that we got beat big team but by a little team I, like you said I, I can't see it happening uh, against Lincoln no absolutely no way especially not at the Emirates you know they're going to yeah. go there by the time they've defrosted <laughs> being frozen like when they walk out there <laughs> they, they, they should be 2-0 down really <laughs> Um, let's move on to happier times. Uh, we won the, 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 the two cup competitions, the League Cup and the FA Cup in 92, 93 season, which unfortunately yeah. you missed for injury. But then, um, you know, the following season, 94, the European Cup Winners Cup run. Take us through that. I mean, you were quite an integral part to that, weren't you, up until a point? Yeah, um, up until the Torino game, really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, I think that was... I played Torino... Um, away and it was nil nil but uh, played played in front of the back four like a a, a cock and roll really and I think you know personally that was my, my best game ever um, and I just I just felt really good and come back from that game looking forward to the to the second leg and that went out there 10 minutes in bang 10 stitches in my ankle and I was just like oh, abs- absolutely gutted and and yet the, and but again the team was able to cope with anything because mm-hmm. we were so strong and then then to go on and beat um PSG and then yeah the, the, it was um, the final it was fantastic yeah absolutely brilliant I mean a few years, I mean obviously a couple of years before that we just got into having won the the, the the league in 91 I mean how difficult was the transition from playing league to European football Period. I mean, obviously, by night four, we, you know, you know, the English clean teams had been in Europe a few years, but was it yeah. difficult to change over? Yeah, the, like the headset, the, the mindset, and whatnot, and the Definitely. game plan. Yeah. I mean, in, in English football, every nearly every club was standard four four two. Still, um, we didn't know how to change. We knew how to change the way we played, but we didn't know how to really integrate different systems and that. And I've got to be honest, 
you know, even even when we went to like a dent in the first the first round, it was that they could knock the ball around, you know, and they technically they're good players, and you're thinking, God, I'm doing a lot of chasing here, but you knew your discipline and everything else in your organisation would would come together and. You know your fitness levels and and everything, um, your mentality, which we had at the time. But I, I felt that when we went to most European sides, all the while I was at the club, that they they had us on a, on technical levels. Nearly every club we went to, even the ones we we hammered. Um, I think Auxerre was it seven? Did we beat them seven in? In, yeah, in one, that was Liège. Like that. Yeah, it was Liège. Right? That's yeah. the Liège. Yeah, sorry, Liège. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, but but when you see them playing on the ball and popping it around, they were they was good players, um, and we wasn't quite at that level technically. But the English game just seemed to be different to the European game, and for for all our uh, our misgivings with technically, we had something that they didn't have, and we could beat them, and that's what we did with most of the teams that year, and. You know, ended up winning it with, um, you know, beating Palmer. It was fantastic. And, and that Palmer team was a great team. I mean, yeah. look at some of the names, you know, and it must have been some, some, you know, some performance. I mean, it was some, some performance to beat them, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. Well, well, again, again, um, like, like I said before, the Tottenham game, I was on the hospitality because I was injured. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was already happy before the kickoff. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and I remember being out there with my wife and that, and um, just just watching the guys. And when I just smacked that goal in, it was just, whoa. You know, I knew I knew that I'd more than played my part in, in oh, the yeah. team, yeah. and I'd earned my medal. So yeah. I didn't feel I didn't feel like I was missing out. I just felt like I wanted to be on the pitch and and just joining in in a little goal celebration. That's all yeah. I really missed. There was a lot of injuries as well, weren't there? You know, I mean, you you, you were injured. Uh, right, he was suspended. Uh, I think uh, Johnny Jensen was injured, wasn't he? Yeah, Ian Selly ended up getting, a, in, getting getting some glory, didn't yeah, he? And, you, and you know, when, Sales again, brilliant. When you look at when you look at that team, um, you know, they, 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 t- you look at the two teams and you think, how, how did we manage such a rear guard action and keep them out? You know, obviously David Seaman was was awesome and and the defence as well. But the whole team was brilliant that night, absolutely f- brilliant. I think if some of our other cup final teams in the ones we've lost had shown anything like the bollocks that that lot had had, then mm. I think we'd have had a bit more yes. silverware. We did, we we did, and uh, you know we 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 did have a, quite a large pair of, of those, yes. um, a, as you mentioned, yes. uh, as as a team, yeah. um, and we was all, we was all strong, tough individuals. But you know, you, uh, how many times have you mentioned the word team when mm. you talk about us back then? Mm. That's what we were. Mm. They were the, we, we weren't anything other than a team. We'd back each other to the hill, right or wrong. We would we would back each other, yeah. and we'd sort it out, you know, in private. And and even then, sometimes not bother because we thought it, it don't matter what you do. You know, mm. if you get in trouble, I don't I don't care that Tony Adams went to prison. You know, I I didn't I didn't think he he was a bad man because he did what he did. Mm. I didn't you know I would have thought that about anyone else probably. Yeah. But I wouldn't think it about Tony because he was in my team. Yeah. Mm. You know, and you don't do that to your own. No. Um, and that's the mentality we had. Yeah. So anyone could do anything within that team. And we all just sort of went, well, we'll take that on the chin as part of the team. Bring him in and, um, you know, dust him down, sort him out and get on with it. Obviously, a lot of that, David, I would say, came from having George as the manager. Now, you know, we've one of the greatest nights in the club's history in, in Copenhagen that night. And then we move forward to the next season, and it's 1994-95, uh, and we get midway through the season and it just starting to get into 95, and obviously there's the whole scandal that broke around the bungs uh, and, and, and George uh, basically getting sacked by the, by the club. What was that period like for the players? Do, do you know what, again... I don't think, and I don't want, I wouldn't want George to think that this is doing him injustice. But we just got on with it. You just, you just, you just get on with it. We, we all knew what George was, and it didn't matter what anyone said about he done this or done that. Mm. That wouldn't have changed our view of him. Mm. You could have said anything. You could have said it, and and we knew that there was there was something much deeper going on than he done that because every manager was doing it. We was getting offered it when we was getting pit clubs were coming in saying if you come and sign for us. You know, we can sort you out this and your man will get sorted out that. Yeah. But no one really cared about that. We wanted to play football and mm. we wanted to play football at the, 
the best place we could with the best manager we could and then George gets dragged for whatever reason um, no one's ever going to know the truth yeah. about that you know uh, and um, I personally I think he, he'd been made a scapegoat for the club and for the FA and for all the clubs in the league that were doing it at the time I think it was like if he takes this on the chin we'll, we'll knock it on the head and if you all clean your act up we won't bother um, going any deeper into it yeah. and and that's exactly what happened and uh, and everybody moved on there, there, there was worse things when Rocky left it was worse than when George Graham left you know uh, for days like that when you see someone who loved the club sitting in the car with a manager crying his eyes out because he's yeah. got to leave the club because they've had such a good offer yeah that, that's what's wrong you know so, yeah. um, but but George is George did the best for that club every day he walked in there like we all did um, Dave, I went to uh, an evening with uh, Ian Wright when he launched his book uh, last year, and um, he was asked about that period, <clears throat> and he said that um, some of the guys were, well, some guys were actually shocked, you know, when the news came out, and some guys were a bit unhappy because they found out that, you know, he'd obviously been, you know, um, earning a little bit extra, uh, whereas a lot of the boys had played you know, uh, and earn two or three times less than some of their England colleagues. I remember you saying that, you know, go go away with England and you'd hear that, you know, so-and-so's on this much and so-and-so's on that much. And, you know, uh, we were still, you know, some of our players were still earning, you know, a bit less than them. And uh, he said that, you know, a couple of players were, you know, were a bit disappointed, let's say, um, when they found that, he'd, you know, he'd creamed off. Not so much that he creamed off, but that he sort of, they felt underpaid, let's say, or undervalued. <laughs> I don't. I've never had a. I've never had a problem. I've never been money driven, right? So every time when I walked into a manager's office and he said, "Dave, I know you're on 200. I'm going to double it to 400." I said, "Yeah, thanks very much," and walked out. I didn't say anything like, "Oh, he's on eight. He's on nine. Mm. And and to be fair, right, he's a good mate of mine. But I would stand here and say to right now. When you was on 15 grand, I was on 1,200 quid, righty, but I weren't knocking on the door. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, if, if he'd have been playing a, and if he'd have had Peter Beersley, he might have scored 60 goals in a ski season, but he only scored 25 when he played with me. That's that's neither here nor there. You know, the manager's picking the team. I, I can't believe that, that players would have been... Um, I, I certainly categorically never heard any player say that he was peed off because George Graham had made 80 grand or and we're not talking millions here because money back then weren't like it is now there, there's more rape going on in the game now when when you've got Pogba's agent getting 15 million out of his deal where's where, yeah. you know and you're talking yeah. about 80 grand in the in your back in the back pocket exactly. um right right he came to the club he was on a decent whack when Dennis came he had a clause in his contract that he gets whatever the best played player gets so right he was never short being short paid yeah. Tony Adams got a pay rise every time he went in the office but I weren't bothered <laughs> I weren't bothered about that even when he was supposed to be going and getting our bonuses for the start of the season sorted out he came out of a pay rise <laughs> do you know what I mean he said sorry lads I, I didn't get I think you're still on £100 a point but I'm on five grand more a week you know that was and, but that never bothered me yeah. I think that didn't bother me because in order to operate with those big guys I knew that that's that's I was at my level now if they was all bitching about money the, the bigger boys then well I, I feel sorry for them really if, yeah. if I tell them that now if because I was more interested in playing every week and going out on a Saturday having a good night and enjoying enjoying being a footballer um, yeah, yeah I never I never ever came across anyone who, who, who mm. bitched about George maybe getting this and that and the other because they, I mean they were still driving around in lovely cars living in Adley Wood or whatever and doing what they was doing it was all it was good <laughs> you know yeah, I think that's fair enough mate yeah I, I agree yeah. with you um, so then like in that period then where George left I mean we were in a bit of a sticky situation <coughs> that season we weren't doing very well in the league uh, I think George had, George had brought uh, Johnny Artson Glenn Elder and Chris Kiwomia in uh, to uh, I don't know whether it was to try and save the season um, but we were still doing well in the in trying to defend the Cup Winners Cup so, I mean, it was a bit weird. It, it must have been strange at the time because then all of a sudden George has gone. You're struggling in the league, but you're looking at retaining the European trophy. I mean, how did how did the rest of that season sort of pan out for you? Well, I, when we say struggling in, in the league, we weren't facing relegation. No. So, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I think unless you're facing relegation, it's just 
it's struggling from a fan's point of view. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for the fans, but you know, there's there's there's, a, there's 12 teams every season would love to be mid table in the Premier League right now and finish. You know, so that's not a bad position to be in. Um, so we weren't struggling, but yeah, well, I suppose it, it is a bit of a um, uh, in the idiosyncrasy where you're in the top of one competition but sort of not favouring well in the other um, but we I suppose it was our team mentality again we were still drawing on that in, in the odd games and being able to pull it together f- f- for the cup games and we should have we should have won that one as well you know that wasn't um, that, that should have been our cup that year as well Yeah. Did you consider yourselves a, f- a cup team? Cause, you know, I just think at the end of it, 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 it maybe we became a, a team that could draw on experiences and our and, and and what we'd done before and and maybe uh, and reach our uh, our peak every two or three games, but we wasn't peaking every one or one and a half games, which is what you need to, to peak at right at the top. You know, it was kind of it, it was becoming the end of an era. I think you could mm-hmm. feel it. I think you could feel the way football was going. We was playing against teams the season before where our, our direct tactic and then picking up the second balls, getting it wide, getting it in the box, we get started to get sussed a little bit by even the not-so-good teams. And it, that's, it started to get a bit difficult. And I think the, the, the likes of Glenn Elder come in were trying to inject a little bit of European play into our game. John came on the back of his goal and and, and obviously Denmark's um, European Championship win. Um, so I think, yeah, maybe we was clutching at a bit of straws. And, and the change should have been made then. We ended up floating around for a year or so with a fellow called Bruce somebody. Um, <laughs> yeah. Didn't and really go anywhere. So he's, obviously we played Bolton uh, previously, the previous season, pre- yeah. season prior to him coming in, and um, they'd done us in the cup or something. Some fat ge- yeah. geezer called John McGinley had, had a game of his life or something like that. And um, you know, then yeah. there was news that he, you know, he, he uh, Rio could come in as manager. I mean, what um, what did the players think of uh, Rio? I mean, how was he when he when he stepped through the door? What was your initial impression of Bruce Rio? <sighs> I don't like swearing, to be honest. <laughs> I don't. I don't like anyone who comes in. Alan Ball did it. You know, I've got a little respect for Alan Ball. He'd done a lot for English football. You know, he was the youngest player to play for England in the World Cup final and all of that. But when a manager, his first, when you walk in a room, a manager of anything, you don't want to hear what they've done. You know, the the the, the, the first thing that that comes out of, that came out of his mouth was what he'd achieved in football, and how he'd achieved it, and how he was going to do that with us. We wasn't him. This wasn't 20 years prior. This was a new era in football. And that, for me, just, I just thought, uh, you know, I, I, it, 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 it met with a bad taste in my mouth. And I just thought, I, I don't like this guy. And, and a lot of people thought that. Particularly when, you, yeah, particularly when you consider some of the lads that he was saying that to. I mean, yeah, exactly. The, the, the likes of yeah. Tony must have been looking around going, is, is yeah. he having a laugh? Well, he's, he's coming in going, I was captain of Scotland, and Tony's going, hold on a minute, I'm captain of F in England, mate. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? What, what are you telling me that, that when you was captain of Scotland and you was you was captain of Derby or, or Villa, I don't know even where he went, but, you know, and, and mate, um, he's cap- you're talking to captain of Arsenal now, you're, you're exactly right. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, he was he was a bit of a, like, a corporal kind of sergeant major-ish and... Um. Yeah, I just you know, I, I didn't get on with him, mate. It's, it's, it's well documented that uh, him and Wright he weren't going to be sending each other Christmas cards. I think, wasn't it? Yeah, well, he fell out with everyone. He fell out with John Arts and Dinny. I mean, John, John won't mind me saying that we played Aston Villa um, away, <laughs> and uh, John had done a story in the, in the paper, double page spread, and it didn't go down well. John was really good friends with Bruce Rioch's son, Gregor Rioch. Right. Um, and Gregor had been quite um, pushed by his father to to do things. Like when, when everybody was... He was a, actually a pro at, at Luton. But during the summer, he wasn't allowed to go on holiday. He had to go on coaching courses and that, right? This is what Bruce made his son do. Um, so, so John did some extraordinary things in Bruce's house because he was... <laughs> friends with Greg um, in Bruce's bedroom and stuff like that and, and, and he, he used to revel in telling us the story so he did this double page spread on, on, on Bruce Rioch and then we, I think we got beat at Villa and 
John was on the coach and we were sitting down and we used to have like a three course meal. They used to start off with like a little bit of smoked salmon on a plate. And um, Bruce has walked on and, and gone to John, get off the coach. You're, you're fucking walking home. And John went, what? And John stood up and he was bigger than Bruce Rioch. And he, he still had his knife in his hands, right, where he'd been eating. <laughs> and Bruce went, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to do me with a knife. And John threw the knife down. He went, I don't need a fucking knife. And as he said that, I think I stood up. Martin Keown stood up. Tony Adams stood up. And Bruce Rioch decided it'd be a good idea to sit down. Um, <laughs> and it ended like that, shall we say. So that's that's the team again. See, yeah. we were still the team. Yeah, yeah. And, one and, one um, one. yeah. yeah, it was. It, and even in things like that, he was just, he just made people uncomfortable. Didn't get the best out of players. Um, no, weren't the best time. And he didn't bring Dennis Perkham to the club either. Right. Good. So your version of events. I mean, how did that go down? I mean, the perceived wisdom is he gave uh, Dean and Co a list, and Dennis was top of that list along with Z- Lizard Azu and Zidane and Shearer and and whatnot. I mean, what's your take on that whole Dennis Burkham coming to the club thing? My my take is that any manager that goes to any top club has a list of the top twenty players that are playing at that point in time, and anyone in their right mind as a decent manager will go to the chairman and say, look, those players can improve your club. I've done my research. That's all he did. That, that's all he did. That weren't... Then David Dean took over and David Dean was a man's man. He was an Arsenal man. He knew, he knew how to work the figures. He knew what it would take to get someone like Dennis at the club. You know, not just what you offer Dennis, but what you say this club wants to be to attract players like Dennis. And I think the change he started the change in the club to attract those sort of players to come to our club. David Dean was very close with the players. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, he'd be in the dressing room. He'd, do you know what? He would never comment on football. Personal. Um, he was just nice. He'd ask you how your families were, make sure you was looked after. Um, but ultimately, you knew that that was because he was a club man. He wanted to do the best for the club. And and I think he got dealt a bit of a shorthand at the club, Mr. Dean. But um, amongst players, there's, I don't think there's a player that doesn't like David Dean or doesn't respect David Dean. Indeed. Do you, do, you, are there, do you think there's still characters like David Dean around clubs these days? I mean, or has that sort of dynamic changed? I mean, we hear that the, um, the Leicester owners are very hands-on. We hear that Abramovich is very hands-on, but it's just, yeah. you know. I don't know. And I think unless you work with these guys, you, you don't really know. I, mm. at, at the end of the day, they're businessmen. Um, and, and, you know, I, I know that David Dean had, had earned a lot of money and lost a lot of money quite a, a couple of, two or three times in his business career, you know, millions, tens of millions, and then lost it all and got it all back, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that they are businessmen at the end of the day. But um, David was an Arsenal man. You said, yeah, right? I, I think mean, there was yeah. Arsenal. He wanted the best for there, Arsenal. There's a guy at Bristol Rovers called Barry Bradshaw, right? Um and I think he had something to do with Toshiba or someone back in the day when they very first come into the UK, made a lot of money. And then he, he bought into Bristol Rovers and he's exactly the same. He, you, you go up to him, he don't want to talk to you about football and stuff like that. He wants to ask you about your family and he, and he loves the fact that you was part of his club. And that's what I think David Dean is. You was part of his club. He would never be involved in another club in his life. Um, he, he was a club man who unfortunately... You know, I think he, he fell fell down because there was more board members probably didn't want him on board than, than did. Mm. Yeah, indeed. I mean, so obviously, right, he's fallen out, and the rest of the guys have fallen out with Rioch. It became an untenable situation. And mm. obviously, at Wenger, this this guy comes in, breezes in, you know, tall, angular, handsome, bespectacled, looks like a professor. What was your initial impression of of, of him when he came in? I didn't think it was any. He was George Clooney, to be honest with you. I didn't think he was handsome. You squeezed that one in there. I don't know what he looked like. He looked more like Deirdre out of Coronation Street, I thought. But, um, I'm comparing him to Real, so, you know. <laughs> oh, right. Um, well, Real was a jock anyway, so that yeah, puts him right at the bottom. Um, no. Uh, well, when, when Wenger came in, he came in a couple of months before the, before the end of the season when he was still at Grand Pass 8. 
Um, I think we played Borussia in the yeah Munchen Gladbach in the European mm. Munchen Gladbach. Yeah, I, th- I, mean, I think that's the first game he came in. He came in the dressing room. We knew he was going to come to the club because David Dean had had been in a few times chatting to us saying, you know, we've got this guy coming. He's coming from, you know, he primed us for it. And then he came in the dressing room for the game, wished us all the best. Um, and then and told us his plans for, for the summer. And Patrick Vieira came um, and didn't really take part in any training because he, he was, I think he just had an operation at the time on his knee, but he was going to be part of the, the next year. Um, and things started moving forward and the training changed. We had... Um, food before we trained and the diets changed and the hours changed that, that we started to train and then I left and went to Portsmouth um, but but yeah I think uh, it, it was a clear and concise change of direction um, with the way players looked after themselves more than anything that, that made the initial impact and that was all engineered by I suppose David Dean's vision I suppose. Yeah, I think David Dean had been setting it up all in the background, priming it all, making sure the staff knew things were in place for this to happen, and it literally happened overnight. Um, yeah, it was it was a, a, a culture shock to, to a lot of the players, but everyone coped with it. You know, it was yeah. it was great, it was refreshing, it was what we needed. Um, we wasn't looking for a manager to get us out of the doldrums anymore. This was a new change, a new focus, a new style. Yeah. Um, and you, everybody wanted to buy into it. You know. I wanted to ask. I mean, I didn't. I don't know about you, Mark, but I didn't know anything about Vieira coming in during preseason or whenever before. Like you know, seeing the guys and whatnot. I just heard about him when he when he made his debut just before he made his debut for for, for Sheffield Wednesday. I mean. You know, uh, and Wenger coming in, you know, whilst he was still at Grand Pass 8 and having a word with the lads. I mean, back then it was obviously a lot easier to keep things hush hush than it is now. Yeah. Um, I suppose stuff like that now would have been would be all over social media before you know uh, Wenger could even get on the flight from Japan. You well, know, it, uh, yeah, it would be, and also obviously, you know, nowadays you can see so much of. I, I mean, funny enough, I put the telly on this afternoon, and I'm looking for the uh, the League Cup final. And I, there, there was a there was a live uh, I think it was an uh, Australian game. There was a live uh, French game and a live German game. Couldn't find the bloody uh, football league anywhere. I go and stream that. But you know, so nowadays you would know you would know this kid Vieira would had been when he was at Cannes, wouldn't he? You know, before he went to Milan, and then you yeah. maybe you you might have seen him at Milan if he you know depending on how much game time he got. It. So it's very different nowadays with the amount of. <laughs> football hipsters for the want of a better word yeah. who uh, who watch well uh, you know and I don't mean that in a bad way Giles because I know you watch a lot of yeah. um, the other European leagues particularly the French league you enjoy didn't you so yeah, yeah it would have been it would have been different but um, yeah yeah that, it was it was a huge change and I, I don't mean any of us knew so it must have been strange for the players but I, I like I, I think it's like what David just said there it was a different a completely different focus. He turned the club on its head, basically. Would you agree with that, David? Yeah, I think I think he did. He, he, he definitely did. Um, the, the focus was. I think when George came in, he got everybody focused, discipline, organisation, and then that lasted for five, six years. And then we got sussed, like I said. And then there was a couple of years transition period. And I think this is what will happen again when the manager decides to not be in the position he's in now. I think it will be. A couple of years transition, and we've seen it at Manu. We've seen it, you know, we're seeing it at other clubs. Um, it, it does take that, and then then we had them couple of years, and then someone came in with a clear, positive, new, fresh idea that everybody was quite happy to go along with. But with the football world as well, like when I said right back in the beginning when we when we started our chat, you know, when it, when you asked me about George when he left. When a new manager comes in, you buy into it. He's the he's running your business. He's running the business now, and he's the manager. So everybody who wants to be employed by that person stands up and listens. When you go into work, wherever you work, if a new manager comes in and he's the top dog and he says, right, this is happening, what do you all say? No, oh, no, we liked it with this and that. No, you don't. You say, right, I'm going to buy into this. I'm going to do the best I can. And he came along with a product that just happened to be new, innovative, and and ready for the market <laughs> and just with a couple of tweaks of a couple of players boom you know it went off for a few years for Arsenal you know uh, up until sort of 04, 05 when 
they had their, their ultimate successes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned about earlier on about when uh, Rocky was told by George that they'd accepted an offer for him. Um, I mean, what, what, what was it like for you when, when you were sort of looking to leave Arsenal? Did you, was it like you, that was presumably your choice that you thought, I'm not too sure how much of a looking I'm going to get here. And as you said earlier, you wanted to play football, so you looked for for another mm, club. Yeah, ish, ish. I mean, it it it's never fully your choice, but there's always a part of your choice. I had a, I had the rest of the season to go on my contract. Um, Stuart Houston was still the manager in tenure at the time, and yeah. he said to me, "Look, you know, fingers coming along, you know, Patrick's here, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Um, Portsmouth are interested in you. We've we we know what sort of figure we want. Um, and and I was on crap money at Arsenal. Do you know what I mean? I, I won the league division one title, earning eight hundred quid a week when people in the team were on eight grand. Do you know? You know? And and I don't care about money. You know that ain't no big deal for me. But then when someone comes along and says, "I'll give you three times that," and which wasn't still wasn't nowhere near what they was getting, you kind of think, you know what? I'm going to be sitting in the reses. <sighs> Yeah, let's go down now. And, and I didn't want to leave. And I was loving what Arsenal was doing because um, the train, well, the training that, that was being put in place for, for Arsenal's um, when he when he turned up, uh, yeah, it was for his arrival. Um, I was I was liking that, and I just thought, you know what, it is a good good deal. I'd had a, just had a child at the time, and we needed to settle somewhere. So we, we went down to Hampshire and. Spent a few years down there, and, and I don't regret it. You know, I had a good few years, picked up a few quid, and and had a good time. But you never, when you've been at Arsenal and won things, it, it's it's hard starting your career at the top. It's hard, it's hard starting up there because nothing ever matches it. Yeah. And you could, you know, I I beat relegation with Portsmouth last game of the season. Um, unbelievable feeling. I wanted to I wanted to dig a piece of the turf up at Bradford and, and take it home with me. But then when I thought about it, I thought, hold on a minute. <laughs> you've won a cup with Arsenal you've won a league with Arsenal and you want to dig up a bit of turf and, for not getting relegated yeah who so was they, 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 yeah it was difficult but yeah. who was it, your manager at Portsmouth who well um oh, God, he, he's a, a spud a spud mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Mr Fennick yeah no, he's mm. a good lad and uh, Terry Venables yeah great oh, right. I, okay. great time yeah. Was 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 Fennick? I know when Fennick was playing, was, was a player in Tottenham. I remember some Arsenal players said that he was like Billy Big Bollocks. Like he had a flashy, I don't know, it might have been a Ford Cortina at the time or something like that. And he was like, you know, he was being the clubs and whatnot with his Tottenham boys, and he was giving it the large. I mean, what? Yeah. what how different was he f- as a manager? He was. From- he was still the same. He was like one of them blokes off Geordie Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> Way well, hey, man, give it big time. Um, he's 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 funny ass. He's he's a great lad. Um, yeah, I think I think all all Tottenham listen. All Tottenham players gave it big time. When when I was an apprentice at Arsenal, and you signed your pro forms, you went from twenty. I think it was thirty five pound a week um, YTS to a hundred and eighty pound a week salary. Tottenham players went on five hundred quid and were given a car. Yeah. So it it started from 18. So it, it's no surprise to me that Terry Fennick was banging on about his full Cortina because <laughs> you know he, he would have been that type. But he's he, he's a really good fellow. I think he's out in um, Trinidad at the moment. He's been out there for a few years coaching. Um, but I still keep in touch with him. Um, yeah. And I was I was glad he signed me. I had a good time, and he was a he was a decent manager, and he was old school, disciplined, but. You know, didn't didn't quite have what it took. What, what happened after Portsmouth then, Dave? So Portsmouth, um, well, a couple of lads from Portsmouth went down to Bristol Rovers, who I was really good friends with, um, Tom, Andy Thompson and Robbie Pethick, and they signed for Bristol Rovers for for Ian Holloway. And then I got a phone call from Ollie um, begging me to come down, help him out, and he had I weren't happy, and he'd do his best for me with money and stuff. And so I took I took a fifty percent pay cut and come down to the south southwest and I love it, mate. It's great down there. What was Holloway like as a character? I mean, he seems like a mad, mad, mad cat. He's mad. Yeah, he's, he's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> he's um the, the the worst thing is he's crazy, but he's really fit as well. So he throws down physical challenges to players. I first went to Bristol Rovers first pre season. He said, right, this morning we're doing a six mile run. 
right? And I've I've been out this morning already, and I've run it. This is what he said, right? <laughs> and I did it in 35 minutes. He said, so if any of you do it in longer than 35 minutes, you'll do it again. Right. And we was like, oh, that'd be a dodder when he went. Yeah. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to set off a minute after you. And if I catch <laughs> you, you'll do it again as well. So not only was he doing it twice in the one day, he was going to run us down as well. Um, yeah, he, he was mad. But uh, limited in his early coaching with Bristol Rovers, but I think he's a bit more advanced now. But um, great character. Really fantastic, fantastic character. Okay, can I ask you, I mean, you... At Portsmouth, you played under Fenwick. I think you played under Alan Ball before you yeah, left Bristol Ballet. Rovers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You played at Rovers. You went. You played under Holloway, Jerry Francis, Gary Thompson. I mean, you've you've obviously after Arsenal, you've you've played under various management to, uh, uh, managers and philosophies and whatnot. And what did you learn? What did you pick up? And who were the? Um, I, I wouldn't. I don't know if anybody, any of them, are comparable to to Georgie Graham or or Arsene Wenger in terms of their philosophy. But who would you have said in your time after Arsenal? Really, you, you learnt a lot from in terms of understanding coaching and structures and tactics and whatnot. And it was a good, you know, good man manager of players. Well, I think um, the gaffer, George Graham, obviously, without a shadow of a doubt, organised that group of players to to within a couple of percent of their ability which is as as best as you can get out of anybody as a manager I think what, whatever business you're in um, and he did that by keeping things simple um, by having strong mentalities in players and being physically physically fit and strong you know going out for a battle every week and I think if anything I've learned that, that within football fitness is is, is one of the biggest keys because a lot of the players at top levels are technically as good as each other. I don't think technically there's there's a lot of difference. Then it comes down to decision making. So you've got players that make decisions for the team or decisions for their self. Um, and I think that can affect the balance in the team. And managers have to recognise you can only have so many players in a team that make decisions based on their self as opposed to based on the team. So you've got to get that right. I think you can go wrong. I think sometimes Arsenal go wrong by maybe playing three or four players in a team that are playing for their self and not for the team. I think that kind of happens at the moment. Um, so I, I would, I would, I would say in answer to your question, just striking a balance is the most important thing about a manager, regardless of tactics and all of that, because a lot of players sort their self out on the pitch. Teams can sort their self out. It's only eleven against eleven, and if we all didn't stood next to our opposite number and said, right, this is a one against one, all right, then then that makes it down to it's going to be somebody's fault. You can individualise. Uh, when you get a team and you, you build that as a team, you're very hard to beat. And I would say without a shadow of a doubt, that, that's what Jules did. So, so yeah, I think getting a team to play and maximising what the team's got is more important than having the actual best players, I think, as Leicester proved last season. Going down the leagues, sorry, Mark. Going down the leagues, um, how, what, what elements become? Is it, is it, is it more? Is, is fitness even more a key thing as you go down? Because obviously they probably don't have the resources as, uh, yeah, uh, the, the same resources as the clubs in the top leagues. So is, is it fitness or is there other elements that become even more key to to, to, to teams and clubs going down the leagues? Uh, do you know? Do you know what? Without individually stripping down players and looking mm. at what they do individually in their life, you can't really answer that. And if you took Meza Ozil, a day in the life of Meza Ozil, and then a day in the life of, um, say, let's say, Matty Taylor, who's just signed from Bristol Rovers to, to Bristol City, that unless you analyse them, exactly what they do throughout their days and how they look after themselves, I don't think you could ever answer that question. Mm -hmm. But I believe watching these games, I watch Bristol Rovers, they're nowhere near as fit as Arsenal period. They're nowhere near as sharp. They're nowhere near as fast. Um, and I think that's down to, the, like what you just said, it, it's down to having the resources, the, the facilities available to condition them, the support that these players have. I mean, players at, at Arsenal, I know that they've got, if, if they want to go out for a meal, 
they don't have to physically pick the phone up and phone a the restaurant. They've got someone who works with the team and they say, oh, me and my wife are thinking of going to this restaurant. Could you organise a car, a parking space for me? And da 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 So they have every single thing taken care of in their daily life. There's no normality for them. Um, so it really is all about the football. Um, maybe at the other end, there's, they, they live in a bit more of a real life. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, it. But but then you're creating a monster, I think. If, and if you do that, you're getting the players who are not Mesut Ozil, but are still earning that sort of money and think they are, are living that lifestyle and acting like them. So, you know, you've got loads of people at the top end who shouldn't shouldn't be up there, who are not much better than the ones at, at, at the other end, but mm. they just have, haven't been afforded the support and the resources. Yeah. Um, it's funny you mention uh, Matty Taylor there. Uh, you must have played in a few uh, Bristol derbies, I take it. Yeah, played played in a couple. Yeah, yeah played they, uh, in a couple. Quite quite feisty. They're worse than the North London ones. Yeah. 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 Definitely. I think, on on um, and off the pitch. Yeah, massively, massively. <laughs> I mean, there's much more Stone Island in Bristol than there is in North London. <laughs> 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 And they're all well in them. Where, what is, what's it? Them duck down coats now, or whatever. Yeah, Canada, Canada Goose. Canada Goose yeah, yeah. There's plenty of Canada Goose down on the Gloucester Road. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you know what? It is. It's, it's a daily battle in Bristol. If 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 someone in Bristol in a red shirt sees someone in a blue shirt across the road to do to do something or say something <laughs> every day, not just not just a week running up to the game or the yeah. week after you've got the bragging rights. Yeah. This is. This any is given day. Ev- any day. If your team gets beat 5 0, they don't care as long as the other team haven't won. Wow. That, so, it, <laughs> a, 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 every day that is. So, on that on that point, what do you make of his move? It's got to be financial, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, brave, he, he, brave lad? He, he, he's brave. Well, he's, he, lives, he lives about eight doors away from me. Oh, all right. Um, but he's moved. <laughs> <laughs> I don't live there no more because the first why. two nights. They had police outside his house the first two nights. Oh my wow. Days. Um, yeah, but listen, he's 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 not young. He's what twenty six, twenty seven. He's he's had his money tripled for for a couple of years. That's the best he's going to get. His wife's pregnant. He, he's he, he needs to maximise his football career, and that's all he's doing. And I, I say to Bristol Rovers fans, you know, just get over it. The club have got three hundred grand for him. And you know, it's just that's just the way it is. But it it, it never goes down like that because they it, it goes deep in Bristol, and I can understand that they they love their clubs. Mm. I think I think a lot of it a lot of it comes down to the fact that we we can never, as fans like Giles and myself and any Arsenal fan, can never actually perceive what it's like to be a professional football player, um, and and you know certainly one who's who's had the the, the honour. Of playing for Arsenal, um, you know, f- it, because we forget that it it does become your job, it does become your livelihood, and therefore other considerations have to come into it, uh, and the decisions that you make compared to how we as fans see it. You know, there's we're we're blinded by loyalty to our club, and uh, so I, I, I think it's it's difficult yeah. for fans to understand. But but but, but players. Play, especially from my era. I mean, I still meet up with a lot of the older guys, and um, there's we we still feel the rivalry. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I know if, if I was a if I was an Arsenal fan, and I saw Mickey Hazard in a bar, I wouldn't go and want to have a drink with Mickey Hazard, right? As an mm-hmm. Arsenal fan, mm-hmm. but I'm an ex-Arsenal player, right? And I love I love, Mickey Hazard's wicked, and I would go and have a drink with him. But if I played football with him the next day. I would want to snap him in half because he's a top <laughs> player, right? And and that is, and he would feel the same. I, I mean, yeah. it, it sounds like Paul, but Paul Allen nearly broke my leg in a charity game, right? <laughs> in a tackle from behind. He's never made a tackle. <laughs> um, Tottenham, he? But no. because it was Arsenal Tottenham, you know, and he wanted to leave a bit on me. But we mm. was in the bar before and the bar after. But, when that game comes about, yes, the rivalry is there because when you play for Arsenal, regardless of what team you supported before, I don't know many Arsenal players that have that have come there supporting one team have not left supporting Arsenal. Yeah, brilliant. And I think that's that. What Arsenal leaves on you, 
Yeah. And even the modern players, even the, the Rizitskis and, you know, you know, Arteta's gone to City or whatever, but I bet he still loves us and he thinks, oh, yeah. what you did for me is so much more than ever and ever did and all of them. You know, Burkamp loves us. Henri yeah. can be an idiot, but he still loves us. He's got to. He, Do you know what I mean? Even Fabregas the other day was a selfie. Yeah. Like, he was like a fan when he was with... They can't help it. Yeah. can't help it. You can't help it. You can't help it. So what um what happened in uh, Bristol was it was it Bristol you finished at or was it did you then did you get a Barnet was it Barnet yeah well my, Mad Dog Martin Allen give me a shout Barnet was struggling wanted to but I mean he, he, he to be fair he did well he broke the bank and offered me a grand a week at Barnet and that was that was decent money then mm. yeah. but I was like Mark I can't travel down every day and he yeah. said we'll do two days a week and I said I can't even do two days for that you know I'm living in Bristol got my kids in school. So we, we, I just, I just said, you know what? It's, I just need to step out, and I've had a good screw. It's been a good, good life. Been a lucky boy. Um, got, got some nice medals and that. Let's, let's sit back and um, see, see what the future brings. So you ended your career under uh, Peter Shreves, but uh, you've, you've played for a few ex Tottenham. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, personnel yeah, in your yeah. career, you know. Yeah, um, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you know, you, you, so what are you doing now then, Dave? I mean, I know you do a bit of media. So I didn't, for Arsenal. Yeah, well, I, I didn't do nothing for a couple of years when I first I just come to Bristol and spent money. You know what I mean? And like, my daughter was in not a cheap school. Um, and you know, you know what? Back in the day, you think you think, oh yeah, I've saved, oh, you know, whatever, a couple of hundred grand or whatever, mate. In the real world, that goes when you ain't earning money. So we we sort of after a few years, I, I said, I need to do something. And my wife. Just said I heard an advert that there was um, they're recruiting for the fire service. Do you fancy doing that? You're a bit of a fireman, you know what I mean? And I thought, well, you know, well, it's not quite the money, but you got the team spirit. You know, it's a load of load of lads predominantly together. Not that I've got yeah. anything against women, but um, that it was kind of an easy transition to make, mm-hmm. um, and and it was a competitive um, uh, environment again. It was a lot of gym based work so we could get in the gym you know you can do that sort of stuff so yeah I had a little go at that and, and got in and, and that's what I kind of I do now you know it's four days on four days off so I still get to time to do a fair bit of work for Arsenal media and, and other little bits and pieces and, and yeah and just in, enjoy myself really so how did that come about how did the Arsenal media work come about then well I started doing that because I'm really good friends with Tom Watt um, and he used to do Lovely. fans forum back in the day yeah. when it was Arsenal TV. Yeah. Went on that a couple of times and just the, the producer had my details. Then they, when they moved over to the um, the digital side um, on on the internet, they just give me a shout and I started doing the games. And I've got into it a bit deeper because now I do all their stats and bits and pieces, me and Clarkey. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of like the old club. If you, The club now is... It, it's, it's, Players used to walk into the box office. I used to know everybody, and everybody used to be friends with everybody. It's, it's quite well separated now because they're they're superstars a little bit. But I love going back there because all the old people are there. And, and the thing is, people are still working at Arsenal for twenty five grand a year when they could be working fifty grand somewhere else. And that's because they love the club. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I love about it. There's all people like me there, um, and that's that's what's good. Well, I'll tell you what, David, I'll take my hat off to you, mate, because I, bet, I guarantee there can't be that many professional footballers who've had a successful career in the game like you have and played for one of the biggest clubs in Europe and won trophies who, at the end of the day, go and be a fireman because, you know, I'm sure you probably could have found a job with a bit less risk in it than mm. uh, than saving people's lives and fighting fires, mate. So, mm. <laughs> full credit to you there, mate. And yeah, do but do you know what, one... Yeah, you, you say you say that, but I think the job the the job sells itself. When you you know, I've done some. I, I, we're on the M5 up here, so I get all the. I, and my station is is predominantly for road traffic collisions and heavy oh, heavy rescue, right? So lorries and stuff like that. Um, I was in a centre before in Bristol, first of all, and so I had the first week I had a, two dead ones in my first week. Um, oh, wow. Pulled one out dead and another one, um, but yeah, it's. I've always been a working class boy and I don't think I'd be happy not being that. 
Um, but you can, you can be that and live in a nice house still and drive a nice car. And yeah, I've got the best car in the fire station car park, but that's the way it goes. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it goes. But I love the job. I love yeah. the boys oh. and it's, it's, it's great, mate. You know, Maximum I love the Maximum credit to you, mate. I think, I think that's, a, that's, crack, a, that's, crack, that's, a, that's a great crack. thing to do. Um, David, I think, you know, having covered, uh, the, the, your your time at the club and, and afterwards and that I think really it brings us round now if if we can sort of ask you about the Arsenal at the moment now I mean obviously we, as you've said you, you're doing media work for the club so you know you're getting on one end you're you're getting a lot of insight into uh, into the games and you know and I love the stuff that, that Adrian Clark does with the uh, breakdown and right. that I think that's really good each week um, but from your point of view how do you you know, we, look, I, I mean, obviously, you know, you you won't know because I'm sure you've got me muted on Twitter. But um, <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I'm a fan who's who's who wants change uh, at the club. You know, I'd love to get rid of the owner, but at the end of the day, I think that's going to be a little bit harder. So I would like there to be a change in management. I'm not expecting yes. you to, to express an opinion one way or the other on that. But you know, if as as, as someone who knows about the game, when you watch the last few years. And you see, you see the, the, what's happened um, each season. What, what's what's your opinion of where Arsenal are now as a club? Well, yes, I'm involved in a club, but I've got a pair of bollocks, and I have got an opinion. And yes, since Wenger came in, listen, he, you've got to remember he's the manager that ultimately got rid of me. Yeah, so when he came in. He had his ideas who he wanted to come at the club. So I, I should be the, the the first person on the list to have him out. And I'm not, but I am coming round to to the thinking that, that it, all good things do come to an end. And a, an era is called an era for a reason, because it covers from one day to another, you know, and <laughs> it doesn't go on forever. Yeah. And I think... And, the Wenger era is dwindling off. The reason why, and I've got a very good opinion on it, and I don't think it's because of losing respect to the players or any losing dressing rooms, anything like that. I do think one or two players are a bit aggravational in the dressing room. Um, but you always get that. Teams deal with that. Mm-hmm. But I said to you right in the beginning, Arsenal's become too nice. Arsene Wenger has built a club there playing nice football, treating players with respect and all the right things, doing all the things the right way, business-wise and everything. And they've got to a level now when they're only attracting players that want to be involved on a nice level. And unless you get a bit of nasty in there, a bit of risk, a bit of um, walking into the unknown, if you know what I mean, maybe getting someone who's maybe a bit dangerous, who could be an anomaly for the club. You know, Chelsea have gambled on keeping Costa there even, and look how he's turned it around. He can be good, he can be good or bad. You know, I think time has probably come for them to start thinking seriously, and I think the manager will as well. I don't think he's a silly man. You don't stay at the top of the game for 20 years at the top club, build it up beyond its expectations. Although Arsenal was big, it was never as big as it is now. Yeah. And that is down to him and the, the directors and the, man, the the chairman and people in charge. And I don't want to get involved in their business because I don't know about that. That's, yeah. that's, clever, that's clever man's business. I don't get involved in that. Um, but my opinion is there is some change needed. And it, when El Nenny signed, I did a, um, a match day show. And we, we, we're we given random interviews. And I'd, I'd never heard of El Nene. I didn't really know much about him. Done a little bit of research. But I was base, I base, base what people are like on what they say to me and, you know, what vibe they give me. And when I see him and, and in his interview, he he said, a words to the effect of since the first day I've got here, it feels like I've walked into a family. Everybody treats me like family. I love this club. It's brilliant working here. I'm looking forward to my future. And, and I'm thinking, no, mate, no. You should be thinking, I'm looking at that midfielder. I want to get that place. I want to win that cup. I want to. I'm going to do things here. I'm going to push on. None of that family stuff. Where does that all come into it? And I think players now 
can get 120 quid grand a week and become part of a family and that's really easy there's no pressure mm. and the, when you haven't got pressure you don't push yourself and when you don't push yourself you don't achieve and i think we've started a little cycle of that and there's one or two too many players in the team in that cycle yeah. and i think i think it does come from the manager you know people have been saying when you look at your manager on the bench and he ain't doing nothing and the players think, well, I ain't going to do nothing then. I've been in that position. I, I managed a non-league, well, a, a ninth tier team down here. Won the cup in our first season, two divisions below any team that had ever been in the final. With the same team the following season, I was doing a bit more Arsenal work. Lost my interest a bit there. Wasn't getting, in, wasn't getting off the bench, wasn't shouting at players. And all my players just started behaving like me and didn't give a shit. And, and we went down. Right. So I can, I can feel what's happening. I've been there. I can empathise with the situation. And I think it does have to culminate in new blood, let's say. That's very, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's very honest of you. Uh, even but I, you, you know, I'm not, I'm not discrediting anything. No, 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 no. no. And there's no, always no. a chance for it to turn around. If, yeah. if it, you know, if Wenger stays till the end of the season, right, and the four best players in the world become available, and he manages to snatch them all and get them in the team, he could become the, what he what he was. There's no, but that ain't gonna happen. No. You know, so I think it's maybe time, maybe time. I oh, appreciate you, appreciate your views on that, mate. Thank you. Indeed, the honesty is very, very refreshing. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a good place to to, to wrap it up. Um, I want to thank Dave, our special guest, for coming on and speaking so candidly about his life at Arsenal and his life in general, and 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 you know how he views Arsenal at the at this present moment in time. So, Dave, thank you for ever so much for coming on um, after having your Sunday dinner and. Yeah, no, I mean, I'd just like to say, guys, I mean, (laughs) look, Arsenal are where they should be in the league at the moment. I think it's a, the league table doesn't lie. At the end of every, you can look at it sort of after three or four months and you can see it forming. And normally, and this is what, going back to George Graham, he'd always say at the end of every season, the league table don't lie. You, you, You end up where you deserve to end up. And I think, you know, at the moment, third and fourth is about where our team deserve to end up. If you look at it statistically, um, historically, any way you want, that's where we deserve to be. And it's, it's no discredit. I mean, it's a great position to be in. But um, I think people just are expecting maybe a little bit more achievement in, in the coming years. And, and to get that, mm-hmm. then that there may need, need to be some change but um, we shall see we shall see indeed um, Mark I want to thank you as well for uh, arranging this um, sp- podcast special with Dave um, and I suppose we'll see you uh, you're going to uh, when's our next game to Liverpool no, 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 no. Liverpool it, yeah. Yeah, it is Liverpool away yeah and Amanda yeah. oh Amanda did ask me to ask you Dave she said that you've been on a, on a former podcast the Guna Girls podcast do you remember that yeah. episode? Yeah, I've been on a couple of times. Yeah, and she said, uh, which is the better podcast to be on? That, that's now, not fair, is it? No, Urs, it's not. Well, listen, <laughs> I've got to say, I've not seen a picture of you guys, but hers is definitely the better looking podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can accept that, I think. Yeah, I can't I can go wrong that. there. If, you, if you'd have said I'm otherwise, wrong. mate, I'd have been a bit worried. But <laughs> I can't go wrong, that's what I mean. No, yeah. no, no lose, no yeah. lose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. No, I really, really appreciate you coming on, mate. It, it, it's uh, it's been, you know, it's great to have an ex-player who's who's happy to come on and talk talk to just regular fans and just chat about the old days and, and give us his views. It's wonderful. Yeah, but so I'm just it, I'm just I'm just a regular fan. I ain't living the football dream, right? No, so I'll do it from. A, I'm a I'm a I'm a oh, fan. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm an armchair fan. Dave, I, Dave, I, I, Dave, I, Dave, listen, mate. L- listen, mate. Never forget one thing. You have lived the dream that every single yes. Arsenal fan has yeah, had I know at that. some point, mate. So yeah, don't, and you know, don't ever, don't ever, you know, just not not realise that, mate. Yeah, no, we, I, I don't, we love you, know what, you guys. Mark, Mark, honestly, mate, honestly, and that will be my first line to any twat Arsenal fan that comes up to me and says anything or ever slags me off about anything. 
I'd just say to him, mate, I've lived your dream. So fuck <laughs> you. It don't matter. <laughs> I'm living your dream. So, you know, oh, dear, it dear. don't matter to me. It's, yeah. it's you know, oh, I, I'm, I'm quite aware of, of, you know, where I come from and, and what I've done. Yes. It's, 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 and I love it, mate. I love it. I love being able to go back there. I love being yeah. special there. I go back there and, and it's the only place that that I am still, even though I wasn't a legend, I'm still special there. I speak to people and people know me. You know what I mean? Yeah, you look they, at what you you look at what you were part of winning, mate. Yeah. 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 No, I don't. There's I don't pe- ever. I love pe- it, mate. I'm, I'm people who've won less. People good. who've won less been called legends, mate. So I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it, yeah. Brian Robson. Yeah. Cool. All right, Mark, Giles, cool. Thank you very much, David. All right, we'll we'll best. post me the link that, that yeah, when you send it out and all that, yeah? Will do, Absolutely. mate. Um, so yeah. I can um, listen to it when I'm driving into London or something. Yeah. Or yeah. bore myself. <laughs> oh, wow, cheers, mate. Um, no, thanks for that, mate. Listen, that's listening to me, mate, not you. <laughs> all right. We'll we're, we're, we're be in touch, yeah? Yeah, cool. No worries, mate. Nice, thanks, one. mate. Thanks very Bye, much. Cheers, mate. Cheers, boys. Cheers, Bye. boys. Bye. So that has been a Goona Ramble podcast special. Hope you enjoy it. Catch us again at the uh, as we review the Liverpool game next weekend, Sunday or Monday, whenever that comes out. And uh, do subscribe, tune in, YouTube, iTunes, on the site www.gunaramble.com, Stitcher, Acast if you're an Android user. And um, that's all for now, folks. Up the Arsenal.